Hello, Liberty lovers, and welcome to the Liberty Mike podcast, broadcasting from an undisclosed location in the heart of Dixie. I am Michael, and I'm here with Liberty Larry. How's it going? So, um, we just passed our first anniversary. I don't know if you knew that. Oh, no, I did not know that. Yep, Tuesday. We went out and celebrated, and we didn't even realize it. (laughs) Well, Uh, we did celebrate. (laughs) Yes. uh, We celebrated it. Not the greatest restaurant in the world, according to some, anyway. It's 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 decent. It's yeah, not the worst. A lot of people would say it's amazing. Yeah, well, they I, make a decent Manhattan. I'll I would, give them that. I would disagree with those people, but <laughs> yeah, my meal was good. I can't complain. Yeah, um, complain. No, our uh, our first uh, published, published, yeah, published, yeah, um, podcast was uh, January twenty first, twenty nineteen. I did not realize that. Mm-hmm. So Tuesday was the day. Nice. One well, whole cool. year of podcast <laughs> of doing this. <laughs> Um, Very cool. So we're still on the air. Yeah, That's something. Yeah, yeah. Hey, we haven't been deplatformed. Yeah. So. <laughs> well, I, th- I actually kind of consider that a bad sign at this point. It means <laughs> felt- we're we're not relevant enough to have been deplatformed. Yeah. I don't know. There's they they there's plenty of good ones they leave alone, but yeah. You know. Um, we're still not on the uh, Southern Poverty Law Center's list of uh, anti-government extremists. Well, we've only been at it a year. Yeah. Well, <laughs> plenty, but, plenty of time to get there. <laughs> as you know, that is the goal of the podcast. All in good time, my friend. All in good time. We will get there. Well, um, we may as well, I guess, pick up kind of where we left off. Um, this this might be a review podcast. Not yeah. a review of the podcast, <laughs> but the review of the last podcast. Yeah. And this is why I've been having trouble getting into the news recently is because it's all the same stuff that we've been talking about for a month. Well, and nothing has changed, but somehow it's still news. Well, it, and we might as well go on the knock it out now. So like impeachment is all over the news right now. It's mm-hmm. everywhere. So um and I don't recommend this by the way, but NPR is playing it. And I think there's a few other stations that are just playing it live like the the impeachment trial. Do not watch that while you're driving. You will fall asleep. Like, it is <laughs> the most boringest thing to listen to in the world. It's horrible. Um, and I've been doing it. I've been listening to it every opportunity I get. So when I'm in the car or when I'm at the house, I'll put it on. But there's nothing there. They're grasping at straws. Yeah. There's there's nothing to this. And they're trying so hard to make it out to be this thing that it's not. And I think in the end... They're gonna the they're damaging themselves. They're they've got Bernie can't and any of them that are in the Senate right now. They can't be on the campaign trail. Elizabeth Warren. Elizabeth Warren too. Mm-hmm. Neither of them can be out on the campaign trail. That's where they need to be. And this is not good for Biden. They can spin it any way they want to. This is bad for Biden. Well, it might be offset by the fact that he's not in the Senate and can be on the campaign trail while well, they're stuck there. He can be on the campaign trail, but he's constantly <laughs> being mentioned in this deal. Mm-hmm. And the, the Democrats are trying to make it out that he is, that, you know, he's innocent in this and that he didn't do anything wrong. But anybody, even Democrats that are listening to this knows there's something there. It may not be the worst thing in the world, but there's corruption there. Yeah. I mean, there is. Well, um... The other thing is that if, okay, so the issue here apparently um, is that this was the uh, military aid was used as leverage to get information about a campaign rival. Isn't yeah. that isn't that essentially what that's, the, that's the, the case. issue is? Yes. So if that's the case, are they saying that if Joe Biden was not a presidential candidate, there would be no crime? Yeah, there. That I mean, that is the case. I okay. mean, they're they're pretty open about that. That if this wasn't, I mean, that's but that but he is a campaign rival. So that that's the argument is that so this is a crime in their mind. So what what they're the, what they have to admit to then is that if he were not a if he were not on the campaign trail himself, if he were not also a presidential candidate, that it would be worthwhile for the president to ask that he be investigated? <laughs> Pretty much. I mean, okay. you, won't, you won't have them admit that. They won't go to those links. And that's part of why it's so boring right now anyway. It's the Democrats are making their case right now, and there's just not a case there to be made. It may get more interesting when um, Trump's attorneys start making the defense case. Mm-hmm. Um, 
and I'm, that's probably not. I doubt be, it. I doubt it. I don't. I don't <laughs> anticipate it being. But who knows? It could be. Um, but that's not scheduled to start till maybe Saturday, is what I'm hearing. So. I mean, until then, it's a snooze fest, and it'll probably continue to be a snooze fest. I'm not going to say it won't be, but it, there may be more substance there. I would like to see them actually call witnesses, though. I think that would actually be – I know Trump's team and whatnot and the Republicans are against that. I think that would actually be better for Trump if they did because mm-hmm. then you can get Hunter Biden up there and some of that, and then that all could get very interesting, Yeah, I, I st- think. Yeah, I still don't think that it would be very interesting, but it would be – um, it, it would show an actual attempt to try and arrive at the truth of the whole thing. Yeah. Um, but I, I don't think that that has ever been the intent of it hasn't. any of this. So. It, and it's not. Um, I mean, the only reason the Democrats want witnesses is so that they can get, um, what's his name? Oh, the guy we hate Bolton. so much. Bolton. John Bolton. They want yeah. Bolton up there. I mean, yeah. that's what they want. And they'll probably get what they want from Bolton because Bolton, I don't think Bolton's ever really been a fan of Trump. Nah. Um, I don't really know why he ever made him his guy. Like, I, I mean, don't either. It didn't make any sense from any angle at the time. So. And yet somehow, even after he's been fired, we're still following his policy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Great. Exactly. Yay! Yeah. <laughs> so. Um. All right. Well. So that's uh, going on. You got. You've got yeah. impeachment. <laughs> <laughs> I, I've got no insight into that except what a waste of time and money. It um, is. And. Just think for the for those of you who believe the government is supposed to do something for you. Yeah. You're paying them right now to do this. I, maybe you think that this is worthwhile. I don't know. But they're certainly not like uh, doing health care reform or any of that stuff while they're doing this. <laughs> no, they are not. Um, and for me, it's just like, except for the waste of money thing, it's like, well, at least they're not doing anything. <laughs> <You know? laughs> yeah, from the libertarian perspective, that's really kind of our view on it. Yeah, you know, could <laughs> they're be, could they're be not worse. making my life any worse. So, <laughs> right? uh, yeah. Anytime they spend doing this, they're not spending time banning stuff and yeah. spending money. <laughs> Every law is another freedom lost, right? Yeah. Um, okay, how about Virginia? That so, that was supposed to happen. It was going to be a violent, uh, crazy, <laughs> um, right-wing uh, militia takeover of the state capitol or something. That's what I heard. That, that's what you heard. It's not what happened at all. It was actually... Um, so the recaps I saw, so I was following it the day of, and so there were pictures of you know people like all kinds of pictures online and stuff going on. And basically it was, it was like super diverse. So like, you've got like gays for guns were there (laughs) and you've got, um, black guns matter was there and all of these different groups were there. Was our guy Maj there? Maj was there. Um, so I mean, it was, it looked like it was a good time. Honestly, I kind of wish I could have went, Yeah. but, um, and and people carry guns all over the place. I guess the way they had it set up was they had the area around the state house fenced off so you couldn't bring your guns there. But um, all all the other areas, people were open carrying. I saw a picture of a guy with a 50 cal walking around the street. And um, somebody brought a guillotine. I actually tried to find more information on the guillotine today. I saw all kinds of pictures of the guillotine. I actually saw police confiscating it. But I couldn't find any information on why it was confiscated, other than I'm sure, like, you can't just walk around with this. <laughs> like a... It was like a legit, it was the like real deal. Like a full-size deal. guillotine? Like, full how was he size. walking around with it? Was it on wheels? Uh, I, I, you couldn't tell because there were people everywhere. I assume mm-hmm. it was on wheels and they were pushing it down the street. Okay. Um, kind of like a parade, you know? Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I guess the concern was that they were going to use it in the same way that they did in the French Revolution. Like That well. was definitely, like, the threat. The threat <laughs> is kind of implied when you're walking down the street yeah. pushing let's, a guillotine. Let's take all these elites down here and <laughs> off with their heads. So... Um. Yeah, but but it was peaceful, like no violence. Um, Antifa, I did a little look, and it looks like Antifa may have been there, but they didn't cause any problems. Mm-hmm. Didn't really see any. I had read some stuff before that they were kind of be out there in support of. Yeah, but I didn't find anything after the fact, as well, far as that goes. I mean, I like to think that that's true. I think we said last time around that. Um, if you truly were anti-fascist, you should be on board with uh with keeping the Second Amendment. Absolutely. Um. So. Maybe some of them have some sense, and it's not just an anti-right wing thing. And anything that's remotely right wing is something they'll protest against. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, they definitely went out there trying to crack heads in that group because let me well, tell yeah. you, <laughs> it wasn't have went well. <laughs> yeah, this is another example of why uh, you know the ability to defend yourself is important. It is absolutely. 
And, and it says something about this, you know, the gun movement in general to be able to have this type of rally and nothing bad happen. You know, I mean, like mm-hmm. people aren't, I mean, it says something about the right to own guns, like why that's so important, you yeah. know, that, you know, <laughs> I just, isn't it's crazy to me. I thought of, I thought of so many things while you were, you were saying that. I was <laughs> yeah. thinking of uh, the uh, Simpsons episode where he joins the NRA. Oh, Homer yeah. joins the NRA after he buys his gun. And uh, he at the end of it, when Marge is making him feel bad about it and he finally gets rid of the gun, yeah. um, he, he apologizes and he says something along the line. He's like, I'm, I'm so sorry, Marge. It, it made me, having the gun made me feel powerful. Like God must feel when he's holding a gun. <laughs> <laughs> nice. <laughs> oh, that's great. And then the other thing I thought of was the uh, the joke about um, guy getting pulled over and the uh, uh, you know the cop license and registration. Do you have any weapons in the vehicle? And he says, uh, Yes, sir, I do. And the officer says, Well, what do you have? He says, Well, I have a twelve gauge in the trunk. I've got a forty five in the glove box, and I got a thirty eight under the seat. <laughs> I said, Good grief, man. What are you afraid of? He says, not a damn thing. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely not a thing. <laughs> oh. um, well, there was, uh, I, I didn't pay any attention really to the rally itself except to know whether there was violence or not. Because I was concerned that there would be some, you know, agent provocateurs, somebody that would trigger violence that wasn't there as part of the gun rally, like wasn't on the pro gun as, side. As a, and I've always worried about that with these type of things. Somebody, some other, some anti-gun person coming up and causing problems just to make the, the gun folks look bad. Um, and the other thing I worried about when I, they were saying they were going to ban weapons of this thing, it's like, man, well, that's just a bad idea in general. Mm-hmm. Because like, obviously there's not going to be any violence if everybody's walking around with guns, but you have a bunch of people with no guns and people who are against guns coming out there. Yeah. It's going to get, there's going to be problems there. Well, uh, the other thing that I thought when they, and I think I mentioned it before too on the last podcast was, um, the, the, I bet they doubled the attendance of that thing by being oh. Firearms. Without question, there's no doubt. And there was, I didn't, I haven't seen any exact numbers, but I've seen numbers that projected it as far as forty to fifty thousand people there. Um, yeah, I heard that there were about sixty thousand people, but they were yeah. projecting a hundred. Yeah, yeah, they didn't. Uh, there wasn't that many. Hundred thousand, not a hundred people. Yeah, yeah, hundred thousand. Uh, yeah, yeah, because you're right. That's what they were saying before, but it uh-huh. didn't. It didn't reach yeah. that. That's still a lot of people. It is. Um, um it, I mean, it definitely makes a show that. You know, people are serious about this. Oh, absolutely. Like, this is something that they consider to be important. And, the, and that was the other thing. Like, so the people that were there, like, they are. They're serious. They're not people that are going to let this go. And mm-hmm. gun folks are that way in general. Like, we're not going to say, we're not going to bow down to this. Like, yeah. we're not going to accept it. And keeping our guns make sure that we don't have to bow down. Exactly. To this kind of thing. Um, and then the other news with that, something else I'll just kind of throw out to you. So I think it was the day after, but I'm not positive. Virginia did pass a um, red flag law. Oh, um, yeah, I heard about that. So Those so are terrible. They are horrible, and it's kind of sad to know that it got passed. Okay. <laughs> well, and they're terrible because it, it um, hmm, I guess it uh, shortcuts past um, the uh, due process. Yeah. Um, essentially, you're, it actually is direct violation of the constitution um oh, that says question. that uh no one shall be deprived of uh liberty or property without due process like if you're taking somebody's guns with without any kind of trial or anything with just an accusation that is literally taking somebody's property without due process no it's, no no you you don't remember trump said take the guns first and then due process oh i remember him saying that it didn't change the constitution any though oh but trump um, trump's right oh man like, you can't well, argue, you're not allowed you're, to argue with trump that's true a true constitutional scholar that guy <laughs> right um, exactly yeah. oh. well uh, the other thing that i i heard is uh, i saw um a bit of uh, david hogg you remember david hogg i do remember david hogg right, this is the parkland <laughs> guy who may or may not have actually been there at the time anyway yeah uh, disregarding all the uh, the uh, conspiracy theories. Um, he's been a very outspoken advocate against uh, people being able to bear arms anywhere. Oh, absolutely. Um, throughout. And somehow he's gotten this like cult level of um, sycophants, you know, like that. The anti gun people <laughs> rally around him. Mm-hmm. 
for whatever reason, like he seems like kind of a, oh, I, I was going to say douchebag, but I'm just going to go on and say it. <laughs> Goofball at least. I mean, yeah. um, it's, he's to the gun movement what uh, Greta is to the To uh, the climate, climate change. Movement. Oh, yeah. absolutely. Um, is somebody young because you're not allowed to attack anybody young. Yep. And, you know, there's this like weird innocence about it, which isn't actually there, but it, I, like, why, why anybody thinks just in general that the person that we really need to listen to is the one with the absolute least experience of life um, <laughs> on de determining our, our future policy is beyond my understanding. I, I just don't get it. Like, Doesn't. I don't know how, well, I, I do kind of know how you were when you were 17. I, <laughs> <laughs> you do. <laughs> um, and I know how I was when I was 17 or David Hogg's now like 19 or 20, I think. Yeah. Um, but even then, like, Looking back, I was a moron. I had no idea anything about the world, really. I mean, I yeah. had not experienced enough to know even really who I was so much at that point. And certainly yeah. not, I, I was not in a position, I was sure that I knew everything, but I know now <laughs> that I was not in a position to give anybody advice about really much of anything. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, and I certainly mean, not government policy. <laughs> of all things, right? <clears throat> yeah. So. Um. So anyway, I, I heard he did a live stream on some social media. I don't know what, because I don't keep up with social media very well, uh, which people complain about. Anyway, um, he said something along the lines of that people are using the Second Amendment to suppress the first. And like I just, I had to Talk sit... Talk about don't get it at all. Yeah, man. I had to sit back at that one, because he has it completely backwards in every way. Yeah, yeah. In every way. Um, first off... People of his ilk are absolutely using their freedom of speech to, in an attempt to to push the government um, to abolish the right to bear arms. Yeah. Like they're using the First <laughs> Amendment to try and suppress the Second Amendment. So right? you know that's he's got it backwards to start with. And just, I mean, hopefully you heard our our classic uh, Liberty Mike on rights and know that rights exist outside of government. They pre-exist yeah. government. They're not something that you can actually take away. You you don't no. you don't remove a right. But They're government not certainly yeah. yeah. Government certainly has the ability to suppress or or prohibit your exercise of a right. Um mm. the ability, not the right. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, all right. Um but and then the other side of that is that the the second amendment protects it, it's the thing that protects the first amendment. Absolutely. Um the right to to bear arms is what allows you to be a dissenter against your government. Yeah. Uh, otherwise, you end up in a position where um, if you can't defend yourself from your government, then if you are a dissenter, then there's a lot of extra options, we'll say, for yeah. the government. Yeah. Um, there's, well, there's nothing there to keep the government in check. And, you know, and people can say what they want about, well, you're not going to fight the government with your guns. But there's a reason that the government is the way it is in this country, and it's not in so many other countries, because it has to do with the right to bear arms. Yeah, well, um, the idea that only having small arms prevents you from being able to defend yourself against a government with high-powered weaponry and nuclear weapons, etc., is historically false. Ask the Vietnamese. Ask the, ask the Afghanis. Yeah, right. Absolutely. Mm. Um, so that that's certainly, yeah, that's, that's not a good argument. Um, and it's... You know that ability to to be a dissenter and to defend yourself. There was a case, I, I'm I can't remember all the details, but there was a case. Uh, I think it was in Kentucky, hundred and some years ago. It was a long time ago. Yeah. Um. But uh, it was before the Civil War, anyway. Um. Hundred and fifty ish years ago, I guess. Uh, yeah. Somewhere. Hundred and sixty seven. Anyway. No reason to get bogged down in the dates. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> point is, uh, there was a guy in uh, whichever county this was, and I can't remember which, um, who was an abolitionist, which was not a popular position where he was. And so there was a, a, a push from the citizenry and the, the government representatives and so forth just to like be constantly harassing this guy and, and so forth. And, um, and he had a cannon on his property. Nice. Yeah. And uh, and there was a, there was a lawsuit related to it, which is the only reason that I know about this. There was a lawsuit yeah. related to it, and his right to 
to have a cannon on his property to defend himself from his local government yeah. was upheld. Nice. Yeah. That's pretty cool, man. Yeah. Um, and that is the whole point of it. Yeah. Is to be able to defend yourself against exactly that. Absolutely. Um, I don't know. We have more to say on the Second Amendment right now. We've always got We've always got plenty to say, but I think we're good for now. I mean, that, that pretty well clears everything up as far as Virginia goes. I yeah. Mean, like I say, it, it, it all went well, and, and I think, you know, People made a good stand for the Second Amendment. So, well, we've talked about it before, and we'll we'll make another um, uh, argument about uh, red flag laws sometime in the future. I'm sure. Oh yeah, uh, they'll this, keep coming. This up. Is, this is going to keep coming up, and unfortunately, I fear more and more places are going to continue to pass these laws. Yeah. Um, and and it's just sad. Yeah, I mean, uh, I guess it. This is the government's way of protecting itself. Yeah. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> um. All right. Well, so. The next thing on the domestic front that I would like to spend a little bit of time talking about um, is this California law about independent contractors that okay. uh, came into effect at the beginning of this year. Um, I mean, it's affected my business. Uh, really? Oh, yeah. Um, absolutely. Like, we, we use independent contractors. Yeah. And, well, yeah, you do. That's right. I forget. Yeah. Um, so there has been a redefinition of what makes a person an independent contractor as opposed to an employee okay. in California. Um, and I can't remember all of them. There's like three main things, but the, the main one that for us is, uh, does the person that you're contracting, um, is their work essentially the same as the work of your business? Oh, really? That's an interesting way to define it. Yeah. So I, um, now, what I think is interesting is that I feel like if you got a good attorney, that you could make the case that, um, well, let's take, so what it's affected at, to a great degree is writers. Okay. Um, people who are freelance writers. Uh, they actually set some kind of limitation on the number of articles that you can have published in any particular uh, journal or um, outlet in a year and, and still, still be, be a freelance. freelance. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> Talk um, about intrusion, man. Just to just okay. to mention that, like that's that's like that's truly massive. The government sticking its nose where it doesn't belong. Yeah, I mean, you can't even like be a freelance writer without having to deal with the government in California. Well, in California, but still, <laughs> I mean, it, it just no. Goes I mean, back. this is spreading. This idea is spreading, and I, yeah. I'll get to why I think that that really is uh, towards the end of this. But yeah. Um, the uh, I think the as far as the freelance writing is concerned, you can't have more than thirty five pieces published in a single outlet in a year and still be considered a freelance. And I, I saw people talking about it and saying, "Look, as a freelance writer, I have to get eighty pieces a month published. <laughs> like, there's only a limited number of there's of only so many outlets. providers, yeah. And uh, and wow. I have to get eighty a month published to survive to just to make ends know. meet, yeah." yeah. Um, so it has affected them tremendously. And I, I remember when the, um, when the law passed Vox specifically, uh, had an article like praising it. Oh, like, great. This is great for everybody, et cetera, et cetera. And then, uh, at the beginning of the year, they laid off something like 200 freelance writers. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, and it, it, they didn't lay them off exactly. They just didn't renew any kind of, uh, contract work. Yeah. Right. Um, and that's how this is going. People aren't getting fired. They're just not getting new work. Yeah. Now that um, all of a sudden they can't get published anywhere and can't make money. Right. Um, and so it, it turned a bunch of independent contractors into employees, uh, if they were to continue to do what they were doing in the way that they were doing it. Yeah. And, um, and of course, if they're employees, then that requires what had formerly been their clients <laughs> now to be their employer and to pay uh, pay them employee benefits, um, which are strict in California in terms of health care uh, provisions and all kinds of stuff. Oh, um, absolutely. So uh, they would have to, the, the employer, the now employer, formerly client, now employer, would have to pay all these extra costs uh, to keep them working. Um, and... Uh, and that's if they, you know, continue to use the no longer an independent contractor. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, so, uh, so they, they're not using them hmm. anymore. Yeah. They're just laying more on the people that are well, their staff. I mean, they probably hired a few extra people, but it doesn't make up for the work that they're. Oh yeah. Turning away now. 
No, that's that's craziness. Mm-hmm. And and then on top of that, you end up with a situation where now not only are, is the company having to pay out all of these benefits, and the company doesn't really want to do that. The person that was the independent before now works for that company. So if they tell them to do something, they're obligated to do it. Exactly. Which is would be my concern because I know like there seems like there's a lot of freedom in being a freelance writer. You can say what you want to say. They can mm-hmm. publish it or they cannot, but you can still say what you want to say. Yeah. It's different when you work for them. Yeah. I mean, I'm a freelance writer in a sense. Yeah. Uh, I only write like one article or two a month, but yeah. still. Still freelance. <laughs> I, I stay under the 35 limit. Though, there that you way. go. That's that's the plan. Right? Yeah, I would have to double my productivity to, uh, yeah. to um, outstrip that. But I, I find it interesting that they, you know, they instituted this law to, uh, you know, quote unquote, protect the class of workers who actually have the most control over what they do, when they do it, for whom, for how long, and for how much money. Absolutely. <laughs> like, <laughs> These are the people that define all of their own terms. Yeah. Um, or, or they agree to them anyway. Yeah. I mean, they can take a job or not take a job. Exactly. Uh, accept a contract or not. Um, it's entirely up to them. And, and, and it, it is a, exactly like it's the libertarian paradise way of doing work actually it's oh absolutely um, everything is completely voluntary from both sides yep absolutely and uh the the other thing that i find um strange about this like paradoxical i guess um is that the the liberal uh california government um whose whose members often invoke you know that weird wage slavery type of uh narrative um are passing a law confining the people in their state to that role. Yeah, right. <laughs> you will be a wage slave. Yeah, you can no longer uh, determine for yourself what work you'll do and and for whom and you know all these other things for yeah. what compensation and when you'll do it and all that stuff. Now you have to be an employee yeah. if you're going to continue to do what you've been doing. Um, oh, it's it's just crazy. It just goes to show that the government cannot fix these problems. Mm-hmm. I mean, the more because what happens is is any type of intervention by the government to try to step in and do this will it creates more in, more room for intervention. So mm-hmm. like they do a little bit. So now we've got so now your employers have to have like they've got to give you health benefits and they got to give you this and they got to give you that. Well, now they're forcing you. Not only is do, do the employers have to do all that. Now you have to go work for those employers. You don't even have a choice. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I, I watched a scene on the Weather Channel year, years ago now that to me is a perfect microcosm of government intervention. Yeah. And it, this is what you're talking about is, is an example. Yeah. Um, or it is expressing exactly that. So I watched uh, – it was a icy road or whatever – and the camera came in after a school bus had slid off the road. It looked like they were going about three miles an hour. I mean, there was no <laughs> no damage or anything. Yeah, it just kind of slid was like, out of the way. Yeah, it was like at something. A, yeah. yeah, it was at a stoplight, and they like slid into the curve and a light post or something like that. Yeah, um, no injuries. No apparent damage done. Yeah. Uh, so, but there's this school bus that's kind of like mostly on the road, but part off the road in the snowy you know, on the snowy road. And so up behind them comes an ambulance. Yeah. And the ambulance doesn't manage to stop quite in time either. So it very slowly slides into the school bus. Yeah. Bang. Again. No real not, damage. Yeah, yeah. I mean, tiny Just, little thing. Yeah. So then here comes a police car. Yeah. They don't manage to stop <laughs> quite in time either. <laughs> So they come sliding in, bang, yeah. back of the ambulance. And then another police car comes. Yeah. Same thing. Yeah. Slides into the back of the whole thing. So you have an accident involving this government vehicle, the school bus. Yeah. And so somebody's like, oh, no, we better call somebody. We call the government. <laughs> and so the government sends their ambulance, the county ambulance, yeah. And the ambulance gets there, but they don't fix the problem. They actually just make the problem worse. Yeah. <laughs> and so then the law enforcement comes to to fix the problem. Finally, the, the real professionals here. The real here, guys right? are here like, now, and right? Don't take that the wrong way because I used to be an EMT. I definitely think those people are real professionals. But yeah. 
just for the for the narrative effect here. <laughs> yes. Um. So the the police car comes in, and you know the the big law enforcement officer, and he didn't fix the problem either. He just makes it worse. Yep. Yeah. And then once again, <laughs> another policeman comes, doesn't fix the problem. Same thing. Just makes it worse. And so what do you do from here? You call more government intervention, right? <laughs> right, I mean, exactly. Like the, there's only one way to fix this, and that's to get more government involved. Eventually, Eventually. somebody's not going to slide into the back of that. <laughs> but I don't know that that's necessarily true. Yeah. It just piles and piles and piles until you yeah. end up with a government that we have now. Yeah. That's just so massive and mm-hmm. so big, and it can't it can't do anything. Yeah. I mean, you you have a problem. Maybe it's a minor problem. Um, maybe it's a big problem, but it'll work itself out probably. I mean, most market problems will just work themselves out if you let it go. In fact, I would say all market problems will eventually work themselves out. Maybe not as fast as you want. So you call for government intervention to get in there and and fix the problem. And the government intervention, maybe it even fixes that problem, but it creates a bigger problem. It creates another. And so then your only answer at this point is to call in the government again to fix that problem. Yep. And so maybe they fix that problem too, but they create another problem. And, just and then you have to call in government piles. and now you got layers and layers of bureaucracy and yep. all of this could have been prevented if you just kept the government out of it to begin with. Exactly. And every time you add a layer of government, it's an a- added layer of cost to us. And yep. um, every time you legislate something, you take away some freedom. Yep, absolutely. So in, in this particular case, this California law, uh, I mean, the effect in the end... Um, is going to be to hamstring uh, small businesses and startups. Yep. Um, they're going to be competing with larger businesses and uh, like unionized businesses. Yep. And I, I point them out specifically because um, the unions will win. The yep. big companies will win. Yep. Um, because, well, the, the unions, they're not using uh, contractors. They're all employees to begin with. Yeah. Big companies can absorb the costs. Um. And what loses is liberty because choices are removed. Absolutely. Like all of these people that used to work for themselves now have to work for somebody else. They've got to go get on the dole somewhere. Yeah, or they're going to have to figure something out. Um, And it may be that they can continue to work for themselves, but... uh, For less money? Yeah, it's going to be hard. I mean, you know, I actually saw um, a Twitter exchange with one uh, um, one of the government representatives representatives that endorsed the bill yeah. and uh and she was saying like well you know the jobs you're complaining about losing they're not good jobs anyway well the people that have them don't necessarily <laughs> agree with that right yeah <laughs> you know? exactly like, i worked hard to create my business for myself and i loved my job and i got to yeah. choose my own hours and so on and so forth and you're telling me that's not a good job screw you right <laughs> um which is yeah. actually a, a lot of the Thread, I'd recommend it, but there was some language. Um, <laughs> right. It sounds like it. <laughs> yeah. And and purportedly, this was for uh, Lyft and Uber businesses, like that those people are so terribly treated and, and they can't make any money doing that. Well, then why do they do it? I mean, once again, well, those are people that they choose to do that work. It's the gig economy. Mm-hmm. It's, you know, you do that alongside your day job. Like you want to make a little extra money and that's something, that's a way to do it. Yeah. You know? Well, and, and this is handled by the free market just like everything else, right? If you think that wages are too low, if you think those people are underpaid for what, what it is that they do, um, well, if those people also agree with that, they don't have to take that job. Exactly. It, and if they don't do it, if Lyft and Uber can't find enough people that are willing to work at the wages that they're offering, they'll pay more. They'll pay more. Exactly. Yeah. In the same way with, um, and that's why like sometimes a Uber will cost more than others is mm-hmm. because like some of those, if they can't find the driver, they up the wage yeah. for, for Well, they that have area. those peak time things. Peak and time. Whatever, well, that's yeah. how that works though. Like, it, but it's all a supply and demand. Absolutely. So. Yeah. Um, now here's what I think that it's really about though. All right. Uh, I think that it's really about making sure that they collect all the taxes that they feel are due to them. Um, mm-hmm. because it is hard to, uh, ensure that, um, that independents are turning in what they're supposed to turn in. Um, That's interesting. It's, I, I think it's about, well, cause it's, it's much easier to collect payroll taxes than to collect taxes from independent from contractors. From a freelancer or somebody yeah. like that. 
That's true, because so, so much of that's under the can potentially be under the table money anyway. or unreported. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it's rather than being reliant on independent contractors accurately reporting their incomes and and turning everything in um, like they're supposed to, uh, they can go after the employers, which are much bigger fish, fish, and they're more centralized, so it's easier to uh, to attack them. Yeah. So that's what I really think that it's about. You may it's be the, right. It's the state making sure that they get all their money. Yeah, exactly. Which is actually your money that they're stealing from you, but, yeah. you well, know. They, making sure that they can steal as much of your money as possible. Exactly. So. Um, that's all really I have about that. I, it's it's very frustrating for us. Um, we're certainly having to change things. Now, like I said, I, I think that if you have a good lawyer, that you can maybe make the case um, that, uh, if you take writing for an example, yeah. uh, that uh, you're the the employer, the the media outlet, their job doesn't you know like I said the one of the main things is that is the job of the contractor essentially the same as the as what the the company produces right yeah. Um, I think that you could make the case that your job as the company is not to write, it's to manage writers and publish. Yeah. I, you know? The problem, <laughs> like, problem I think you run into there is, is I guarantee you these places employ writers. Mm -hmm. So that would be the kind of counter argument to that. And the other thing I would say is how many of these writers can really afford a good attorney? Like good attorneys aren't cheap. Well, yeah, no, but it's the company that's going to be wanting to get the attorney. Oh, that will be get. Yeah, so well, that makes sense. They don't have sense. to pay for all that extra stuff. This is true. Yeah, this is true. Um, yeah. let's see, we got fifteen or so minutes left here. Uh, so I wanted to go over Trump's speech from a couple of weeks ago after um, Iran responded to the Qasem Soleimani. Um, assassination with the rocket attack on the couple of Iraqi bases that were housing U.S. troops. Yeah. And I listened to, I, I didn't even hear the whole speech because I got frustrated. Um, <laughs> but it seemed to me that, and some people are going to jump on board with this right away because they have their opinion about Donald Trump. Yeah. But I just want people to understand like how you're being propagandized all the time. Just about every statement he made in the first few minutes, five minutes or so of the speech about Iran and Qasem Soleimani was a lie. Yeah. W was a demonstrable lie. <laughs> Easy to prove. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I, I'd like to go through this, and I'm not entirely sure how this is going to work because we can't do all this live exactly. So I I'm going to be cutting in bits of this clip as we go along. Um, so I, I'm going to try and like leave spaces and cut it in and then remove the spaces. If it sounds choppy, let me know. And I apologize, but I, I'm, I'm pretty sure that I can make this relatively seamless. Yeah. Um, so I guess here we, here we go. <laughs> yeah. We suffered no casualties. All of our soldiers are safe. Okay. He says that there's no casualties. Um, well, there were actually 11, uh, soldiers flown out of Iraq for concussive injuries. Um, so like there was damage done. It wasn't, I mean, the U S was just like downplaying the, the damage done. Yeah. Um, and so there, there's lie number one, <laughs> actually it's not even lie number one, but this is the first one that we're going to address. This is, yeah. All right. Because of the precautions taken the dispersal of forces, and an early warning system that worked very well. Okay, uh, the early warning system that he refers to here that um, was in ensured that there were no casualties, which was already a lie. Yeah. Um, the early warning system that worked so well was that it, the government of Iran informed the government of Iraq and they also notified the Swiss embassy in Tehran of the impending attacks. It wasn't some great uh, technological miracle by the United States that prevented uh, more damage. They got early warning from Iran. <laughs> That's funny. I salute the incredible skill and courage of America's men and women in uniform for far too long, all the way back to 1979 to be exact. All right, and this is just an example of truncating the antecedents. Um, he says, since 1979, like history began in 1979, uh, you know, he talks about this Iran destabilizing the region. 
Like, what about the Western involvement since way back farther than 1979? I mean, you know, it's we talked about before last week, um, we talked about how the uh, the Western powers came in and just like divided up the Middle East uh, without any regard to who lived where and what kind of uh, affinities already existed. Um, I, I think that that did something to destabilize the region. Uh, you know, giving away a bunch of Palestinian land to the um, to the Jews uh, to form Israel that created some destabilization. I mean, not to mention the uh, of course the U.S. and the speaking about Iran specifically, um, the U.S. and the British and Intelligence overthrowing the elected leader Mohammed Mossadegh to install the Shah. That created some problems. But let's just pretend that all that stuff didn't happen. And the first thing that ever happened in the history of the Iran U.S. relations was when they uh, revolted against the Shah and then overtook the U.S. embassy after the U.S. invited <laughs> the Shah into the United States for medical treatment instead of sending him back to Iran to stand trial like they asked for. <laughs> Iran has been the leading sponsor of terrorism and their pursuit of nuclear weapons threatens the civilized world. Okay, Iran is the leading sponsor of terrorism. This is just absolutely absurd. Uh, most terrorism is a Sunni jihadist, not Shia. Um, I mean, that's just a, it's a documented fact. You can look it up in anywhere. I mean, it's not this is not a, a secret. Um, and this idea that they're pursuing nuclear weapons that's so pervasive is just an outright lie. It's just a bullface lie. Um, the uh, We talked about way back, one of our early podcasts about the history of our relations with Iran, um, that there was a, a, a fatwa issued by the Ayatollah. Um, this is a religious decree. Remember, this is a theocracy, right? Like, it's yeah. ruled by the... You know, the religious the religion, leaders. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it was a religious decree that said that um, that weapons of mass destruction, and they didn't limit it in any ways. Weapons of mass destruction, so presumably chemical, biological, nuclear, um, in the same way that we define it, um, are against the founding tenets of Islam and would not be used by Iran. And what's more um, is that in the Iran-Iraq war in the 1980s, um, Iraq, led by, led by Saddam Hussein, actually used chemical weapons against the Iranians, um, killed thousands of people with chemical weapons, and um, they had the ability to respond with chemical weapons of their own and chose not to. Yeah. And just as a side note, the United States supported Iraq, I was not Iran. Say, I was fixing to say, <laughs> guess whose side we were on then? Yeah. <laughs> Go back and look. Uh, it, which is part of the reason we were so adamant that Iraq had weapons of mass destruction in 2000. Was because we sold them to Because them. we gave them to them. <laughs> yeah. Um, the, that was one of the great lines in a uh, Chappelle show, yeah. right? Uh, with, um, uh, what's his name? Paul Mooney? Is it I think Paul it Mooney? is Paul Mooney. Yeah. yeah. Um, when they asked him, uh, how do we know that the Iraq had uh, nuclear or had weapons of mass destruction? And he said, because Bush has the receipt. Bush has the receipts. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Um, and what's more is that the U.S. intelligence, like it, if you put faith in U.S. intelligence, which I don't particularly, but uh, I know that they um, will hedge towards starting conflict rather than preventing it. Yeah. I say I know that. I'm I'm confident you about feel, that. That's how yeah. you feel about it. Yeah. Um, but the U.S. intelligence says Iran discontinued research into nuclear weapons in like 2003, um, yeah. after we took out their chief rival over there, Saddam Hussein in Iraq. <laughs> All right. By the way, um, and even then, it was research, not production. They weren't actually working on a nuclear weapon. The way this is presented to the public is like that they had 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 it that the nuclear weapons program was something that they were building a nuclear weapons. They hadn't even gotten the hammers out. Like there's <laughs> no hammers, no uh, you know, no uranium. It was just research into the feasibility of a nuclear weapon. Yeah, and they stopped that then, in you know, 15 years ago, and. Bringing that up reminds me of Netanyahu. You remember Netanyahu <laughs> yes. a year or two ago? He goes into the whole thing and he's got like all the CDs and all the papers behind him while he's giving his speech about how we got to stop Iran and their work on. Look at all of this that Iran has on nuclear weapons. All that documentation he had behind him, that was at least 15 years old. <laughs> all right. There was nothing new in there. That was just uh, it was a way to get you back on board with the idea of taking down Iran. Mm -hmm. I got more to say about that a little bit later, how we're going to close this, because I, I, I 
this is something we're going to talk more about in the future. Right. Um, so uh, let's just move to the next clip. All right. At my direction, the United States military eliminated the world's top terrorist, Qasem Soleimani. Soleimani is the top terrorist? The, the top terrorist. Um, I have some questions about that. We already introduced the problem of uh, defining state actors as terrorists. Uh, like, how, is, how does that apply yeah, back that's, to us? That's probably not a road we want to go down. No, no. Um, I mean, he directs a state military force. And so I, I just don't, I, I don't think that it's fair to call him a terrorist. Well, actually, I do think it's fair that you call him a terrorist, but then you have to apply that all around. Across the board. Um, and that cre creates some problems for the U.S. military, I think. Um, and are you actually telling me here that he's worse than Ayman al-Zawahiri, <laughs> like the butcher of New York? I mean, are, are we are we actually saying that this guy is worse than the, the guy who planned the 9-11 attacks? Yeah. But Soleimani is the worst terrorist, right? <laughs> right, yeah. Okay, not so sure about that one. He fueled bloody civil wars all across the region. All right, <laughs> blaming Iran for the bloody civil wars across the region is just the height of, I say you are what I am. Yeah. I mean, like, who's actually responsible for bloody civil wars across the region? Who, who's more responsible, I should say? Iran or the United States? Yeah. Well, our hands are pretty dirty. Over there. I'm just <laughs> yeah. saying, like, I, and I'm not a hate America first guy. I'm just saying we're pretty involved over there. No, you know, and uh, so my mom, um, after she read my article that was at anti-war last week, uh, she sent me a text saying that it, you know, it was well-written, clearly well-researched, but that she didn't agree with my approach of blaming the United States for everything. No. And uh, so let me clarify that right now, um, as l since I have a microphone. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, I'm not trying to blame the United States for everything. I, or I'm not saying that, they're, that the United States is solely to blame for what's going on. Clearly, the, the other actors in the region uh, share some blame as well. Um, but I think that the way that it's generally presented to us is that we have no blame. There's no blame to be placed on the United States. And I just want to be sure that people understand that we are making decisions here, um, that are, you know, okay, this is what I actually want people to understand. We're playing in their yard. They're not playing in ours. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. This is their country. This is their homeland. Yeah. Um, so just keep that in mind when you talk about how things should be in the Middle East and why the U.S. needs to involve itself. That's this a, isn't our place to decide. That's a good point, because just like you say, it's not, I mean, we don't live there. And this, they, we shouldn't expect them to, to follow our traditions or anything like that. Like, yeah. I mean, we're, just like you say, we're in their backyard. Yeah. I mean, there was a time when I think the United States really tried to maintain the idea of this shining light on the hill or whatever that old expression was yeah. um and i think that we should go back to that like you want people to uh to adopt the kind of lifestyle that we've adopted here why don't we just show them how good it is by by being prosperous happy people here instead of going and trying and taking it to them and like you will be a democracy whether you like it or not yeah democracy by force yeah <laughs> um yeah this is the one thing that you don't get to vote on yeah right, right? <laughs> yeah. um so, uh, yeah, to the next clip. The planting of roadside bombs that maim and dismember their victims. All right. I linked a, a little blog from um, Scott Horton in my article when they talked about that. I mean, I assume that when he says that uh, responsible for these roadside bombs and so forth, that he's talking about the EFPs, the explosively formed projectiles that were so deadly in Iraq. Um, there is ample evidence uh, and I say, you know, go pull up that um, that particular blog because it links like eight or so articles from the time period that um, have a lot to say about that. Yeah. And uh, I think there's ample evidence to suggest or well, I mean, there's no doubt that these things were being machined in Iraq by Iraqis 
Now, where they got the technology, I don't know, but it's not high tech. I mean, yeah. all you need is copper and some explosive in a simple machine shop. And we live in a time where inform- it's the information age. Like, oh, yeah. You can find these things. Like, if you want to know how to build something, it doesn't matter where you're at. Like, there's a way to find out. Yeah, like, YouTube. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. That's how I fix my car. Yeah, it's how I get this podcast done. <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> Soleimani directed the recent attacks on U.S. personnel in Iraq that badly wounded four service members and killed one American, and he orchestrated the violent assault on the U.S. Embassy in Baghdad. All right. Um, so the idea that Soleimani is responsible for the attacks on the base in Kirkuk and the assault of the U.S. Embassy in Baghdad, um, there's been absolutely no evidence presented to support that like none whatsoever yeah. go look for it right. if, you, if you can find it send it to me michael at the liberty i'd be happy to to take a look at it but i haven't seen it um there is uh, plenty of reason to believe that isis was responsible for the rocket attacks in kirkuk uh they had uh, attacked the base with rockets before and they threatened to do it again um so there's yeah you can't tie this to soleimani um, or Iran, for that matter. And then, of course, the, the assault on the U.S. embassy uh, was done by Iraqis. I mean, they were Shia militia. But just because you're a Shia doesn't mean that you're working at the behest of Iran. We keep running into this problem. I mean, that country, and has been, even when the Sunni dictator was over the top of it, was like 60% Shia. <laughs> so it, it's not, you can't blame everything done by a Shia on Iran. And the attacks... Uh, or the assault on the embassy happened right after uh, we had launched um, airstrikes against a half a dozen or uh, nearly half a dozen, I guess, um, b- Shiite militia bases in Iraq and Syria. And yeah, I mean, to think that the, maybe the Shia militia men in Iraq might not respond to that uh, is just the height of folly. Um, so clearly like you you can't blame all of this on Iran. And I suppose that's it. But this is just like this is just uh, you got like a minute and 15 seconds of this yeah. this speech. <laughs> and just the And the, Mike just tore it apart. <laughs> <laughs> just the the sheer number of lies in this. Yeah. So watch the propagandizing. Like Yeah. I, I mean that's really the point is, you know, just pay attention to what you're taking in. You know, because because so much of it is just just horrible propaganda. It, it's crazy. Yeah, and it's easily disproven. But they're they're counting on the fact that you don't listen to podcasts like this, yeah. that you don't read at antiwar dot com, that you're not willing to look stuff up on your own, that you will just accept whatever the government line is. Yep, absolutely. So don't be that guy. Absolutely. Which clearly you're not because you're listening to us now. Yeah, you made, you made it 50 <laughs> minutes into this thing, so you're not that guy. Yep. Um, um, so I just have one little thing to close out on, and it's kind of a, a it's kind of a teaser maybe for a future episode because I definitely want to spend more time on this, but not right now because right. we're you know Closing 50, out, 50 yeah. minutes in. Um, so today uh, they were doing speeches in, um, well, I guess they were in. Jerusalem, but I'm not sure. Anyway, they were doing speeches in Israel. Uh, it was a uh, in remembrance of the 75th anniversary of the liberation of Auschwitz. Oh, okay. okay. So, is I mean, they had there were lots of people out there giving speeches. Mike Pence gave a speech. Yep, I heard um, about this. Oh, I heard that that this was going on. Yeah, uh, Putin gave a speech. They didn't cover that one. Don't know why. <laughs> I was actually really curious what he had to say. Um, and uh, but what I what I definitely heard was Netanyahu's speech. Oh, we really? Yeah. So um, first off, like you know, he says the kind of things that you should in a situation like this, um, remembering the the people at Auschwitz and all the other um, all the other the Jews that died in the Holocaust, and um, and thanking the Allied powers for uh, taking down the German regime and freeing all these Jews and and so on and so forth. And and I don't want to sully this. Like, the Holocaust is like a real stain on the history of humanity. Oh, okay? without question. <laughs> you know. Without question. But he also uses this opportunity um, in front of uh, leaders and representatives from like a quarter of the world uh, to call for the destruction of Iran. Yeah. Right? <laughs> 
um, claiming that, and, and his reasoning for this is that they have called for the destruction of Israel. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Mutual and, destruction. Yeah. And citing um, Iran's pursuit of nuclear weapons, which we know he's been like banging this drum for 20 years. Uh, and they've always been like six months to two years from nuclear weapons in that entire time. Yeah. Imagine that. Yet somehow they still don't have any nuclear weapons yet. Sounds like we're doing a good job. Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> well, but then we canceled that treaty. Well, yeah. yeah. Um, but anyway, like, and I find it, this is, uh, I, I think I'm going to use the, um, the term ironic in the way that it's used most often now, which is like another way of saying, um, you are what you say others are. Yeah. Okay. So I, I've, I find it interesting that he's going to say um, Iran has been calling for the destruction of Israel and therefore we should destroy Iran. Yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, citing the nuclear weapons thing, which we just, I mean, I went over several things, reasons to believe that that's just, uh, that's just an outright lie. Um, well, at the same time, Israel is not a party to the non-proliferation treaty and it, it is a, a, an open secret that Israel has undeclared nuclear weapons. Yeah, I mean, I've always heard that. I mean, I don't know how much truth there is to it, but I've heard that. Um, I, I will point out here that Iran has made a threat that they're going to withdraw from the NPT to try and um, uh, get the European countries to get back on board with the JCPOA, with the Iran nuclear agreement, um, which, again, I, I said before, is superfluous because they are a party to the non-proliferation treaty. They've already <laughs> agreed that they're not going to develop nuclear weapons. Yeah. Um, but anyway, I, I don't think that they should do that. I don't think they should actually withdraw um, because it just creates another reason to for... Another stone to throw. Yeah, for Israel, the United States, and whatever other powers are involved in this to say, yep. um, oh, well, they even withdrew from the NPT, so we know they're making nuclear weapons now. Yeah. Um, but uh, it does, it, it's like a six-month thing, so they have to declare that they're going to withdraw uh, six months beforehand. They, they can't actually make any changes to their behavior um, under the non-proliferation treaty uh, until after six months. So they're trying to do it um, to get the European uh, powers, that is France, Germany, the UK, um, to do whatever it is that they need to do to get back on board with the JCPOA. And they're essentially giving them a time frame. Like all of these things that they've done where they've gone past their limits of, uh, of nuclear enrichment, um, their stockpile limits, et cetera, like all of these have been these like step-by-step -step things that they've done to push past the, the limits of the JCPOA um, to try and get everybody else to get back on board. Um, and so this is just another another one of those things. Yeah. But um, I don't know if you're aware, I'm kind of falling down the rabbit hole here, so I, <laughs> I apologize. But um, I don't know if you're aware, but they uh, the European powers triggered the dispute resolution mechanism in the JCPOA oh, um, really? recently. And it came out that the reason that they did it um, is because the U.S. threatened 25% auto um, tariffs if they didn't. Really? Yeah. No, I hadn't heard that at all. <laughs> <laughs> so, anyway. Um, and But this thing by Netanyahu with the nuclear thing, when they actually, like Israel actually does have undeclared nuclear weapons, and there's no reason to believe that Iran does, um, but they're being blamed for it. And um, we should destroy them because they said that they would destroy us, uh, which is also not entirely true, but I don't have time to go into it. Um, this is, like I said, this is one of those things where it's, you know, that you are what you say others are. And I was thinking about this recently because I, I heard one of the, in this case, in the case of what I was hearing, it was about gender discrimination in, um, um, I guess in Hollywood, uh, they were saying that there's clear gender bias in Hollywood because, um, over the last 15 years or something like that, only... 4% or 6% of the highest grossing films uh, were directed by women. And um, that uh, of all the people that make new films, like films for the first time, um, only 17% of women that make a film make a second film. 
and something like 40% of men that make a film make a second film. And so this is a clear sign of gender bias. And that may be true within Hollywood, I guess is a possibility, but I don't know about you. I'm, I'm actually something of a film buff and I generally don't know the director when I go see a film. <laughs> no, like I'm certainly not making true. decisions of, based on whether it's a man or a woman. Like, yeah. uh, I don't know. I mean, if it's Tarantino, I'm going, but <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, there are some people that are really well known. Like, you yeah. know, that it's a Scorsese film because it's in the title. Yeah. Uh, you know, there's some people that have had enough of an impact, um, on the film world that, that they that get their name them. in yeah. the marquee. Right. Yeah. Um, but most people don't No, It's true. Uh, it absolutely is true. And so I was thinking about, you know, you got these people that rage against discrimination and white people and men and um, claim that due to the historical injustice of discrimination, which they absolutely abhor, uh, they are now advocating discrimination against groups which historically discriminated against other groups to make up for the historical injustice of discrimination. Oh, you can't make this stuff up. I man. know, it's so bizarre. Like, <laughs> that's insane, man. Yeah. Wow. Um, and just as a parting shot, this is totally unrelated, but I'm, <laughs> I, I was. I, I'm thinking about this. Right. Um, so I, I was up talking to some people last night and uh, at, at my friend's shop. And he likes to, so he introduces me through some kind of political title all the time to other people. So last night I was the resident libertarian. Oh, nice. And I said, well, I think that I'm, I'm well past the resident level of my education in libertarianism, but whatever. Um, and, so another guy in there that he was introducing me to, actually the guy he was introducing me to is says, Oh, well, I'm a socialist. Oh, this will be fun. <laughs> and <laughs> All right. so he was kind of, uh, he was kind of an older gentleman. Um, yeah. well older than me then I think anyway. And, uh, and so I was like, so my friend does this thing because Intentionally. I'm, yeah, yeah. Oh yeah. Um, I, I, he's trying to get me to, you know, provide free education or, uh, <laughs> maybe he just enjoys watching me debate with people or I, I don't know anyway. Um, but I wasn't giving any free lectures last night. And so I just said, um, uh, you should know better by now. <laughs> yeah. <all right. laughs> but I was thinking about it later and I was like, you know, what is the proper response? Cause I get tired of debating socialists cause there's no, yeah. uh, like there's no getting through to them most Once, of the time. Yeah. I mean, especially when they're that age. Like, oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> like, you're not changing his Actually, mind. Well, I, on the other hand, he's probably more reasonable about it than a than a college age kid. That's probably, it, it may be true. Um, I don't know. I, I'm, I'm going to spend true. a little time working with him, uh, like a little over a week from now. So we'll find out, I guess. <laughs> it um, will come up, I promise. Yes. Uh, I'm sure that it will. But I was thinking, like, what, what's the thing that I can say to somebody when they announce to me that they're a socialist that'll just like shut down that conversation right away? <laughs> I thought, this is what it is. What I should say when somebody announces to me that they're a socialist is I should say, oh, um, like Hitler or like Stalin? <laughs> or, or, oh. or, or maybe Mao. Mao, right? Yeah. Which, yeah. Of these, which of these great men do you align yourself with? Yeah, right. Because I need to know so I know how to, how to take this conversation. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, that's great. I may use that. <laughs> Actually, it's, the, it's amazing because it comes up more than you think. Oh, it does, doesn't it? <laughs> well, and I, I figure the answer is going to be, well, I, you know, they, their their socialism isn't what I'm looking for. Actually, I may get, well, they were communists, not socialists. I'm like, eh. <laughs> so um, we're going to parse hairs here? Yeah, well, no, but they, they call it themselves communists, but they were socialists. I mean, it's All like right. the, the Democratic People's Republic of North Korea, right? <laughs> like, just because you call yourself a, a people's republic and a democratic doesn't mean that you are. Yeah, you're none of those things, <laughs> right? right? Um, but I, I figure that the answer that I'm most likely to get is like, oh, well, you know, that that's not the kind of socialism that I'm on board with. And then you say, well, what kind of socialism are you on board with? And they say, well, you know, like they'll name uh, Sweden. Swiss model, yeah. Yeah, Sweden or Denmark. That's something. always the reply. And I'll, 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 then you have to say, well, they're not socialist. They're a social safety net built on top of a capitalist economic system. Yeah. And because of their social safety net built on top of that capitalist economic system, they are at best reducing their growth levels. And generally speaking, it's just like a slow contraction. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's like a slow burn, man. It's a good thing they were capitalist before because eventually you <laughs> run out of money when you do it this way. Exactly. Um, 
So, but yeah. anyway, I thought that was funny. And like I said, this is really for just shutting down the conversation because yeah. like you don't feel like doing that, this debate that again. That person's not going to have that conversation when, you, when yeah. you tell them that. Probably Odds not. are, yeah. Probably not. I don't know. Either that or they're going to get really <laughs> fired up. <laughs> yeah. So learn learn how to thoroughly <laughs> offend people at the Liberty Mic. Absolutely. You know? Mm. Well, um, I suppose that that's uh, that's it for the evening. Unless you got something else you want to yeah, add, I'm 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 good, man. All right, have a good time. Um, well, uh, as always, um, follow us on Facebook, uh, subscribe on iTunes or Podbean, uh, like and share. Um, reviews are nice. Uh, I'm interested to see. I haven't been on Podbean, but I've been getting all kinds of notifications from Podbean this week about activity. Oh yeah, so. I don't know what we're going to find when we go to post the thing tonight, but we may have new followers. Oh, that'd be sweet. <laughs> well, for those of you that are new, thank you for following, and uh, join us again next time when we finally get this right. All right. Train how you fight. Ciao. Later. Later.